Today's video is brought to you by Siemens Furniture. Welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. This month's artist was selected by all of you via the Deep Discog Dive decision, so thanks to all of you who voted. I'll be selecting the artist next month, but the poll will be back for next month's dive. And as always, you're welcome to leave comments suggesting artists you'd like to see me cover, and check out the Spotify playlist in the description that has all of the songs I mentioned in this video, plus a few more of my favorites. This month's artist, ties in very well with last month's Doom Dive because we're looking at a rap outfit that were as integral to the sound of hip hop as Doom was, and maybe even more so. But you know what? It's all expected, things are for the looking, and if you've got the money, they're for the booking. Or at least they used to be. Today, we're looking at a tribe called Quest. Let's dive in. Hi, I'm Q-Tip, I'm an Aries. I'm a sick puppy. Let's start out in Queens, New York. Kamal Farid and Malik Taylor were friends who had known each other since they were two. Both were encouraging each other to get more into music and rap. Kamal started battle rapping at Murray Bergtrom High School under the name MC Lovechild, with assistance from his friend Ali Shaheed Muhammad. The two began writing and producing music in 1985, with Kamal on vocals and Ali as DJ. Kamal even got to spend some time in the studio, working with local acts like the Jungle Brothers and De La Soul. Eventually, Malik joined in, as did another friend, Roby White. A few years later, Africa Baby Bam from the Jungle Brothers gave the group their official name, a tribe called Quest. Along with the group name, Kamal and Malik began performing under aliases, Kamal as Q-Tip and Malik as Fife Dog. Quest would spend the next two years recording and shopping their music around. After getting a ton of offers for record deals, they signed a six-album deal with Jive Records, a modest label that would eventually sign both NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. Is A Tribe Called Quest a boy band? A couple of singles later, the group put out their first studio album, People's Instinctive Travels and the Path of Rhythm, released in April 1990, was critically acclaimed and commercially... The most surprising thing about the group's debut, though, is that it's not really the debut of the group. Fife Dog isn't here for most of the record, same with Jerobi. At the time, they weren't considered full-on members of A Tribe Called Quest. Plus, Fife had a tendency to skip sessions to hang with friends, which clashed against Q-Tip's determined mindset. This is basically Q-Tip and Ali Shaheed Muhammad for the entire runtime. Because of that, I wouldn't recommend this one to start out with if you wanted the most whole representation of Quest. Does that mean it's bad? God no! Right from the start, Q-Tip and Ali prove themselves to be expert crate diggers, weaving samples and grooves from the past to create a singular new sound. You can find samples from Stevie Wonder, The Velvet Underground, Roy Ayers, and more combined with a remarkable exuberance. You can feel how much fun the group were having making this one. In fact, part of that might be attributed to where they were recording. At the time, Calliope Studios in Manhattan was also being used by musicians like the Jungle Brothers, Queen Latifah, Prince Paul, De La Soul, all of them were a part of the 90s rap collective known as the Native Tongues, so having that kind of creative camaraderie in one building must have been electrifying. Lyrically, Q-Tip sets himself apart as a conscious MC, with this record having quite a diverse range of topics. Women, religion, one sense of community, personal aspirations, a full story where he forgets his wallet because of an attractive woman at a diner in a town named after a Sanford and Son record joke. Elsie who? Elsie Gundam. There's even a song about the benefits of a vegetarian diet. Could you imagine like Kendrick Lamar on a song talking about financial literacy? Oh, I guess he did do that. Plus, when he does show up, Fife does a great job, specifically on album highlight, Can I Kick It? Quest used this record as a platform to explore all the different directions their sound and style could go, though as a result, the record is a bit scattershot and a little unfocused. That said, if what these guys were going for was an all-night party, a total buffet of a debut album, then this is a wild success. And even with some songs that can feel like they bog down the runtime, there is absolutely enough here to convince you of Quest's potential. Quest wanted to get right back into the studio after releasing their debut, but Jive made them go each and every place with a mic in their hand. Immediately after that, the group set up shop at Battery Studios in New York 
but not without some changes to their lineup and personal lives. First off, Jarovi recorded a few verses for this new album, but left the group halfway through to go to culinary school. The adventures of Chef Jarovi White would continue as a spin-off for the foreseeable future, though he would still keep in touch with the group and even come by and hang out during recording sessions. In addition, Fife Dog was diagnosed with diabetes, and while he considered leaving as well, he was convinced to stay. And the now trio were determined to give this next record their highest effort. Or should I say, their lowest. The group's second record, The Low End Theory, was released on September 24th, 1991. You know what's crazy? This was the same release day as Red Hot Chili Peppers' Blood Sugar Sex Magic and Nirvana's Nevermind. You know what's even crazier? This might be the best of those records. The main thing that separates this album from the group's first is jazz. People's instinctive travels had jazz elements in it, but the low end theory is soaked in jazz traditions while adapting them to create something fresh. In fact, the opener basically kicks off with a thesis statement for both the record and the group, talking about how they are a part of this time-honored cycle. This is where Quest really narrowed down on their signature sonic style, focusing mainly on bass and vocals. Is a tribe called Quest Hyperpop? Not to mention, this thing sounds pristine. The quality they were able to eke out of these old vinyl samples is remarkable. I would go as far as to call this the Asia of 90s hip hop. Apparently that was a goal of Quest and engineer Bob Power on here, so shout out to Bob Power on this one. He's the real MVP. Q-Tip is once again in tip top shape, but Fife Dog really takes advantage of his time on here. Everything from his delivery to his higher pitched voice compared to Q-Tip, he truly comes into to his own as a part of the group, and it's a ton of fun to hear it in real time, like on Buggin' Out. And Scenario not only planted itself as the Native Tongue's anthem at the time, but it also gave a platform for rising star Busta Rhymes from the leaders of the new school. While the positivity and inclusivity still reign supreme here, they do flip the other way on occasion. The album title is a double entendre, referring to both the bass presence on the record and the status of black men in society. And show business is the most biting the group has been thus far taking aim at the music industry. I also think this is where I need to mention Georgie Porgy. So turns out this song, Show Business, is actually a re-recorded version of another song, Georgie Porgy, that Jive had to beg Tribe not to include on the record. Why is that? Well, because it's about gay people and how much Quest hate them. Like, going back to MF Doom with his homophobic track, you could chalk it up to Doom's villainous character acting like a fourth grade bully. This one though is less, haha, these people I don't like are gay, and more, being gay is a sin and you will go to hell. You could try saying they were joking, but God, you'd have to assume they had a commitment to the joke that was, Let's call it severely misguided and leave it at that. If you're really curious and want to form your own opinion on it, you can find it online. It seems like the group has matured in the years since, but yeah, yeah, it's a blemish to be sure. Thankfully, it's not on low end theory, so it doesn't impact my impression of the album. And my impression of the album is that it's a classic. It's a body of work that created a completely new style that mirrors the best qualities of its inspiration. And even 30 years later, as of 2021, it hasn't aged a day. The Low End Theory was a flat out success in every single possible way. Critics adored it, the public loved it, the sales blew past their first record, and they were considered pioneers of their sound. One might think then that their brand of jazz heavy sampling and conscious clarity would be the norm going forward for hip hop. And that's the mentality Quest had when they began recording their third album. As work progressed, however, things started to shift. The other groups of the native tongues either disbanded or dropped poorly received records, and the big records from New York's rap scene showed a shift away from Tribe's brand of Afrocentrism. Heck, Q-Tip even worked on one of them. It doesn't help either that the West Coast said, with one of its natives dropping The Chronic in 1993, a record that firmly placed G-Funk as the hot sound of rap. And on top of all that, tensions between Fife and Q-Tip, who had effectively become the face of the group, were reaching a tipping point. But despite all of that, the group released Midnight Marauders in November 1993, the same day as Enter the Wu-Tang. 
I feel like there's a metaphor in there somewhere. Midnight Marauders continues the jazz streak tribe kicked off, but the production manages to incorporate elements from other sectors of 90s rap, specifically boom bap. Plus, whereas Tribe and Bob Power had cleaned up samples as much as possible on low end, they decided to keep in the vinyl imperfections on this album. The result is something that finds its own timbral character apart from its predecessor and a fantastic meld of what East Coast rap could be at the time. I also liked the short interludes featuring Laurel Dan, who was the secretary at Jive Records. They lend the whole record a sense of cohesion without being distracting, sort of like People's Instinctive Travels where they had these short skits with Jerobi as an MC. In addition, there's a newfound sense of melody on here, not necessarily in the sung sense, but in the cadences that Q-Tip and Fife adopt in their flow. Tracks like the singles Award Tour and Electric Relaxation have some of the catchiest refrains of any tribe song. Also, they sampled red clay. Q-Tip and Fife still have great chemistry, which is remarkable considering the tension behind the scenes, and Fife even gets to flex his storytelling muscles on 8 million stories. The song is just him listing out things that annoy him, and it's great. So is this better than Low End Theory? I don't really care. They're both excellent albums, and I'm glad they both exist to complement one another. If I had you over for dinner and you told me one of these albums was your favorite Quest record, I definitely would not put poison in the mashed potatoes. The next three years for Quest were filled with changes. Both Q-Tip and Ali converted to Islam, Fife Dog moved to Atlanta to pursue sports writing, and in part because he thought Tribe was done. Ali also did production work for other artists. Worth mentioning specifically is his role on Brown Sugar by rising R&B star D'Angelo. The biggest change, at least when it comes to the music, was Q-Tip and Ali starting a proper production group called The Uma. Joining the two of them was a young Detroit producer named J.D. And if that name doesn't sound familiar, it might be because it's missing a few letters. That same producer would later be known as Jay Dilla. So the gang's all here for the next record. Q-Tip, Ali, JD, Consequence, Fife D Wait, who's, who's Consequence? So turns out Q-Tip brought on his cousin, rapper Consequence, to guest on this record. You'll understand why guest is in quotes in a bit. Regardless, the group's fourth record, Beats, Rhymes, and Life, was released in July 1996. The album kicks off with phony rappers, a song dissing phony rappers. Now, dissing other rappers like this is in no way new for hip hop. It's a well-worn topic, and if there's any group with the clout and skill to do it, it's Quest. But at the same time, this is Quest, the group that built their whole vibe around community and love, and to hear them kick off an album by punching down feels maybe not bad, but just different. That might be the best way to describe this whole album. The troubles of the world have always been reflected in Quest's music, but they've been window dressing for the most part. With this record, they go from the window dressing to the Garfield couch. It is a record that feels bogged down by the harsher realities of life, and again, it's not bad, just different. Another example, everyone kind of sounds like they're on autopilot. Fife especially, though there is somewhat of a reason. You see, going back a second ago, when I said Consequence was a guest on here, I meant he's on a third of the track list. His presence, coupled with Q-Tip's own controlling mentality in the studio, led to Fife becoming even more disillusioned with his place in the group, and his distance from NYC certainly didn't help. Granted, no one on here sounds bad, but rather they just sound distracted and unfocused. And to some extent, so is the production. Now let me be clear, there is no conceivable way that production by Tribe plus the future Jay Dilla could be bad. If I had you over for dinner and you told me the production on here was bad, I would put poison in the mashed potatoes. But on this record, they put less emphasis on jazz sampling and more on mixing jazz with synths and other R&B flourishes. There are highlights to be sure, get a hold once again, stressed out all sound great today, but a lot of the album has a fatigue that past Tribe records didn't. Again, that's not bad, it's just different. There is enough here to make it worth a listen, though that is in part due to its place in history and what it represented for the group as a whole. If nothing else, this was Jay Dilla's proper introduction to the mainstream, and that alone is enough to justify this album's existence. 
By the time Beats came out, the rap world was once again shifting. The hot names were Tupac, Biggie, Snoop, Wu-Tang, Plus, we were about a year away from having Jay-Z and OutKast blow the lid off the genre again. Of course, part of Tribe's whole appeal is that they do their own thing and lay low. And that's what they planned to do with their fifth album, despite a pretty major setback. While this record was initially supposed to come out in May 1998, a fire at Q-Tip's home studio not only delayed the album, but also destroyed his entire record collection and many unreleased Tribe songs. From what I've read, no one was hurt in the fire, and I'm very thankful for that. But man, to lose all of that unreleased music, it's a disappointing loss, to be sure. Later that year, in September 1998, The Love Movement was released. The album's central theme is... Take a guess. And there are a couple of great highlights. The one song everybody comes back to is Find A Way, and for good reason, because it feels like the best version of what they were trying to do on beats. Also, Like It Like That features a fuzz-laden guitar part that's super subtle, but ties the track together perfectly. It's honestly one of my favorite production moves by the group. Q-Tip and Fife sound a bit livelier here than they did on beats, and their chemistry kinda reminds me of Big Boy and Andre, circa speaker box Love Below. Q-Tip's a sensual, charismatic lover type, and Fife is a bit rough rougher in presentation, but displays a workmanship that has its own charm. But as a whole, this one sounds sterile. It sounds like a robot was fed the last four records and was told to make another one like them. Again, production by the Uma, solid stuff, mashed potatoes, but there's just not much memorable on here. You know what's also impacting my opinion on this album? The cover art. I haven't touched on this yet, but the past four records have had some of the wildest, most captivating artwork of any record from their time. And then there's this one. Looking at this, I feel like I'm about to read a brochure in a doctor's office. I feel like I'm about to start up an early 2000s DVD menu. To be clear, the love movement is not bad, but if you choose to dive into Tribe's work, this should probably be the last album you check out. In fact, for a good while, this was the last Tribe record you could check out. It should have been called The Last Movement. You know what I'm saying? So a month before the love movement was even released, a tribe called Quest announced they were breaking up. The specific reason has been debated. Q-Tip at the time cited record label drama. Some thought it was due to tensions between Q-Tip and Fife finally going past their tipping point. Jerobi and Fife said later on that their musical approach was just becoming less and less viable in the present. And that's it. See you next time. But you know what, we've got a lot of time left, so why don't I go through what each member did after they broke up. First off, for anyone wondering, yes, the adventures of Chef Jerobi White were still ongoing. Fife put out a solo album in 2000 that included a verse dissing Q-Tip, leading to more spicy drama between the two. Most of the 2000s for him, though, were spent tending to his diabetes treatment. Ali went on to form groups with other artists, most notably Lucy Pearl with Raphael Sadiq and Don Robinson. He also put out a solo album in 2004 that is, unfortunately, out of print and not on streaming services, but it is on YouTube if you're interested. Prepare to be shocked. Q-Tip was the most active after they disbanded. He spent his early solo days learning to play piano and drums, plus studying bel canto, which, I mean, wouldn't it be sick if Q-Tip played Coachella, but with a performance of The Barber of Seville? I want that now. But instead of that, he gave us a bunch of solo albums. Amplified in 2000, The Renaissance in 2008, and Kamal the Abstract, which was supposed to come out in 2002, but was shelved by his label until 2009. If you give any of these a listen, make it The Renaissance. There are moments on it that could stand side by side with Tribe's best work. Kamal the Abstract is the most interesting since it tries to incorporate a live band. I get why his label thought it would be too hard to market, but it really could have been an album that grew in reputation over time. At the very least, if it came out today, I think people would have loved it. For Amplified, the only thing I vividly remember is that one of the guests is Korn. So each member continued on their own way, but in 2006, Tribe actually rejoined for some touring dates. In some part, this was due to the group wanting to help Fife, who needed to pay for diabetes treatment. Over the next couple of years, the group would pop up for a performance or a recording every so often while doing their own individual thing. In 2013, Q-Tip announced that their last round of shows would be some supporting dates for Kanye Zizis tour. So that's it, right? Not quite. In 2015, in support of People's Instinctive Travels turning 25, the group performed on Jimmy Fallon. 
And something about that night was different. Maybe it was a rekindling of Tribe's creative zest. Maybe it was the terrorist attacks in Paris that same night. Whatever it was, the group then decided to leave behind the petty stuff and get back into the studio. The trio recorded in secret at Q-Tip's New Jersey studio. And when I say trio, it's not who you would expect. Ali was too busy producing the soundtrack with Adrian Young for the Luke Cage Netflix series. So he, he's not on here at all. Instead, Jerobi White came back to record his first verses since the 90s. Work on the album progressed for about a year or so, but as it was being finished, Fife Dog passed away in March 2016 due to complications from diabetes. The remaining members of Tribe finished up the album and dedicated it to the late Fife Dog. Ladies and gentlemen, at long last... <laughs> In November 2016, the group released We Got It From Here, Thank You For Your Service, and it may just be the recency bias talking, but this one is outstanding. Somehow, nearly 20 years after their last record, Tribe sound the most alive and vibrant that they have since Midnight Marauders. The biggest thing setting this one apart from the other albums is rock. Now this isn't Quest's rebirth or anything, but with this album, Q-Tip was taking influence from rock acts like Iggy Pop, plus the recording process had him bringing in gear that had been used by Frank Zappa, Jimi Hendrix, and the Ramones. The sound of this record is modern yet timeless, like a long lost record from the 70s being remixed for current times. Production highlights include Solid Wall of Sound, featuring Jack White and an Elton John sample, Melatonin, and Moving Backwards with Anderson Pack. But despite the sonic throwback, the topics on here are more contemporary than ever. While subject matter from past records does pop up here, the trio tackle it through the lens of the political climate circa 2016. I adore Opener the Space Program, which has one of the best beats on the album and harkens back to Lowen's focus on how black people are treated in America. We the People might be the most outwardly political song Tribe have released since, again, Midnight Marauders. However, the one song you might expect to be specifically about 2016 politics is actually a tribute to the late Fife Dog, which closes out the album. Speaking of Fife, he sounds great on here, along with Q-Tip, Jerobi, and the various guests, Jack White, Anderson Pack, Kendrick Lamar, Andre 3000, Busta Rhymes, Consequence. It really feels like Tribe got everyone from their past, plus a whole mess of artists who they themselves inspired for one big final party. Overall, the greatest compliment I can give this one is that it's the ending that Tribe deserved. These guys came back after years away and leaving on less than positive terms, and they made an album that can stand with their best. All of you bad folks, you must go. Tribe toured for most of 2017, with their last performance being at Bestival in England. They released one more music video for the Space Program in March 2018, which was billed as their last video. Ali kept working with Adrian Young. They even released an album together as The Midnight Hour in 2018. You might actually recognize one of their songs because it was eventually sampled by Kendrick Lamar on Untitled Unmastered. Jerobi continued his culinary career, and judging from this 2011 documentary, he seems very happy with it. Speaking of which, a documentary was released in 2011 about the group and their history. Obviously, given the release date, it doesn't cover everything, but if you're interested in learning more about Tribe, check it out. It's a good watch. Q-Tip's been the most active, producing for artists like Anderson Pack, Danny Brown, and Eminem. He says he has three more solo albums on the way at some point too, so that'll be cool. Finally, last month we got a Fife Dog single with Busta Rhymes and Redman, plus news of a posthumous second album being released later this year. And that's it. A Tribe Called Quest, their six albums, and their indelible impact on music. Thinking about how much these people inspired me and how powerful the influence of the music was and how it made that walk to study hall so short. I had never heard nothing like that in my whole life. And that's where I changed. Tribe, they meant everything to me. They, they are everything, everything. From just a kid that just like, you know, hot beats to really following something. Anything I ever did wrong, blame Tip and Fife because y'all raised me. 
If you want to get into A Tribe Called Quest, make your first two listens The Low End Theory and Midnight Marauders, and then follow that up with People's Instinctive Travels and We Got It From Here. And if you have a favorite Quest song or album or related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments. Again, there's no poll for this month, but it will be back with next month's dive, so feel free to leave comments down below suggesting any artists that you'd like me to cover, and check out the Spotify playlist too. Thanks for watching. Thank you.